Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank you, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have Kevin Meyer joining us today as he discusses protecting your intellectual property. Before we get started, uh, just a few quick housekeeping items during the presentation. If you have any technical issues or questions, please put your issue or question in the chat window and uh, Becky or I will do our best to assess, assist you. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function and we'll organize any questions uh, to be addressed by Kevin at the end of today's presentation. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, the uh, Q&A and chat functions are located at the bottom of your Zoom window. window. Um, all right, now that that is all out of the way, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Meyer. Kevin is a patent attorney at Barley Snyder in Malvern, Pennsylvania, and is involved in patent application preparation and prosecution trademark matters, and litigation support across all areas of intellectual property law, including research and strategy development. Uh, Kevin's distinct background as a U.S. Patent and Trademark Office patent examiner has given him an intricate inside knowledge of how the patent process works, what a patent examiner is looking for in a patent application, and the best course to chart for representing a client throughout a range of patent-related matters. Um, Kevin, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Leo. Um, thanks, everyone, for taking the time out of your day to join us for this presentation. Um, you're probably thinking, well, if you see that uh, slide there, if that's in any indication, I'm in for a lot of text. Uh, and even though this is a legal presentation, I'm going to try to break it up as much as I can. I'll use some examples, and uh, to the extent possible, we're going to avoid reading uh, blocks of legalese and sort of try to explain our way through it and illustrate the points instead. Uh, and as Leo mentioned, I'll take uh, questions at the end. I know we already have one, uh, so I'll address that. I'll address that one first. But any others, you can just put in at the, uh, the Q and A at the bottom. All right. So, so what are what are we planning to cover here? So, we're going to go over the various forms of IP. So we have patents, trade secrets, trademarks, and copyrights. And you see a uh, poorly drawn sketch of a bike there with a motor. Uh, I've, I've used that because I'm going to try to use, as an example, through all of these forms of IP to illustrate if we created a product like this, uh, how, how could we protect it with the various forms, which apply to which parts of the bike that we've invented. Um, it's just, just kind of as a, as a framing example that we can use uh, throughout, throughout the presentation. And so this is the part where, where somebody usually jokes that uh, you won't be tested on the material here, but we will be including a couple of quiz questions, uh, mostly just, just to illustrate some points and to break up and be talking more than anything else. But uh, there will be no, no grading or anything like that. All right, so starting out with patents. So I think the, the main question to address first is what, what type of subject matter is even suitable for a patent? So what are we even talking about when we say patentable subject matter, if we have a product, what are, you know, what, what can possibly be protected by a patent? So just to simplify the potential subject matter here, we have products, processes, and compositions of matter. So there are some other ones too, like plant patents, but those get a little, those get a little esoteric. So we'll keep it to the main categories here. So a product would be if we go back to the bike example, it would be the bike itself. Uh, it could be parts of the bike as well as we'll talk about later. Uh, but mainly we're looking at sort of physical things when we talk about products. Process, uh, this one is a little bit less obvious to some people, I think. So you can patent an improved process even if it, or any type of process, but even if it results in the same product as, uh, as, as may exist out there already, if the way that you get there is an improvement on, on what's been done before. So um, maybe to illustrate the point here, suppose we have a bike and we have, right, the frame is painted with a certain type of paint. Um, but maybe we've discovered that if we have put it through a new process where we wipe down the frame with some sort of compound or something beforehand, we let the compound dry, and then we apply the paint, uh, that the paint adheres much better. So even though the product might be the same as what came before, which is a bike with a certain type of paint on it, uh, the process of getting there results in some improvement. So 
uh, in that sense, you could file a patent application on, on that process too. And lastly, we have their composition of matter. So usually what we're talking about there is um, like a metal alloy uh, vaccine formulation, something where we have uh, a claim that'll, that'll say something like X percentage of this first, this first piece, uh, Y percentage of this other piece, um, similar to a product, but you're really sort of claiming a, almost a mixture, you could call it that. And really the point there is that you don't necessarily need to have a widget, you know, like a, a product that you're putting out there in order to be able to file for a patent. There are other, other inventions and other improvements that can also be covered by, by a patent application. And then second on that slide there, what are the requirements to receive a patent? So they, this idea that we're filing in the application must be new, useful, and non-obvious. So that's a, that's a favorite patent legalese term there at the end. Uh, new just means basically is, has this exact thing existed before? So even if there's one small change from something that has come before, it's considered new enough to get a patent, at least under that under the new requirement. And that's usually what's new and what's not new is usually established through prior patents, uh, prior technical documents like uh, white papers, research papers, that sort of thing, uh, or even prior products in the market. So anything that's publicly available uh, can be used to determine whether something is new or not new. Uh, useful is a pretty low bar, um, basically as long as it has some sort of purpose and isn't only for, um, you know, some, something negative or, or, you know, let's say uh, a perpetual motion machine would, would fall, would fail under usefulness um, just because it's, it's, it can't exist. But in, in the 10 years that I've been working, I'd, I've never seen an application fail for the useful uh, prong there. So that's that's not one that we usually worry about. And that non-obvious is basically the patent office's way of saying, well, yes, maybe something is new. Maybe all of these exact pieces haven't existed together before. Uh, but if it's just a variation based on what's come before, that's um, very expected. Or maybe you're just taking things that existed beforehand and you're putting them together in a way um, that although maybe it hadn't been done exactly, um, everybody who worked in that area of technology would be able to say, oh yeah, you could do that. And this is the result that you would get. Uh, so really what they're looking to protect there is prevent people from getting patents on things that are um, sort, of a, sort of improvements that are known and out there, but may not be embodied in one specific thing that exists already. Okay, so. Now we, we have our bike idea, and suppose we're interested in filing a patent application. So I think if we're going to take one thing away from, from the patent portion of this presentation, I think this is probably the most important concept, is the, the timeline for filing an application. So yeah, and especially for startups and small businesses, this is something that we see um, as, a, as maybe one of the biggest potential hurdles in the patent process. So the application needs to be filed by the first offer for sale or the first public disclosure of the invention. So what's an offer for sale? An offer for sale would be any type of communication to somebody else that would give that person, that customer, the ability to say, yes, I agree to buy that invention. Um, the public disclosure is any type of non-confidential communication that describes the invention. So that could be, uh, you could be presenting at a, a conference, um, you know, technical conference, something like that. Or it could even be, there have been some cases that have held that even one person, as long as they're not bound to any confidentiality, uh, one person, one other person that you tell it to can count as a public disclosure. Um, one way we can combat that public disclosure and prevent it from, from becoming a problem is uh, agreeing to NDAs, uh, non-disclosure agreements or, or confidential disclosure agreements. If you are disclosing it to small groups of people, you can have each of them sign one of those. And as long as they're bound, then it doesn't count as a public disclosure. As you can imagine, that's, that gets to be very difficult if you have a you know, presentation or some, some sort of a context like that. 
in a recent case, uh, the NDA will not protect you for an offer for sale. Um, so even if you had a confidential agreement with someone, uh, if if you have offered to them to buy the invention, it still it still triggers that uh, that potential prohibition there. So that's definitely something something significant to watch out for. And the other key piece of this timing is is the difference between the U.S. and foreign jurisdictions. So in the U.S., once that offer for sale or the public disclosure happens. You have one year from that date to file your application. Uh, if you wait longer than a year, then um, you, have, you have forfeited the, the chance to file on that particular invention. That may seem a little bit harsh, but uh, foreign countries are, are actually pretty much across the board uh, worse than that. So we call that, that one year period the grace period in the US. And foreign jurisdictions, uh, they don't have a grace period. So if you have offered your invention for sale or if you've publicly disclosed it uh, right as of that point, you have, you have lost the ability to file a patent application. So we, we tend to, to recommend that the best thing to do is to try to, just to, try to file before you tell anyone uh, to use NDAs whenever you can. Um, but again, that won't protect you from an offer for sale. And then at least in the US, we do have that one year period. So, um, you know, you do have some leeway there, but, um, you know, so for example, if you, if you have disclosed it and then later you file in the U.S., you can't then file in a foreign country. Uh, so you've, you've lost some rights there. So as I said, uh, we were going to uh, do a little bit of testing here. So I've come up with, a, with an example. So for this one, let's just assume that that we have invented this this bike that I showed at the beginning. Um, suppose that that somehow this is a this is a completely new idea to have a bike with an electric motor, where um, as we pedal it starts to store some energy in the motor, and if we need it we can trigger a little bit of a, a little bit of a drive output, maybe it help us up the hill or something like that. So for this question, let so let's assume we've invented it uh, soon after the webinar. And we have it all worked out in June, but we haven't told anybody about it yet. So we have this contact with a large bike manufacturer. Uh, it finally comes through and we have a, a big meeting set up for them in July. We tell them about the invention in detail, uh, but we do not have a confidentiality agreement. They are they're very interested in the bike, but they mentioned that they had to think about it a little bit. So based on that July meeting, we start to think, well, this maybe this idea really is, is something that's going to take off. Uh, so in August, we contact a patent attorney to file an application. And could we, uh, could we have that first poll? All right, so the first question, just to illustrate the timeline point, um, can we file an application in the US based on that, based on that fact pattern? And uh, the second one is, can we still file abroad? Right, so yes, we can still file in the US um, because although we have disclosed it, we're still within a year, so we're still good there. Um, but as we were discussing before, we cannot file abroad because we have disclosed it and we didn't file anything until after the disclosure. Um, and critically, that disclosure did not have a confidentiality agreement. So really that question there is just to, just to kind of drive home the importance of the timing there for, for patents. Um, as I mentioned, it, it, that tends to be one of the more difficult um, things to consider, especially as a, as a startup business where you have this tension between trying to market your idea to raise the capital, but also um, needing to preserve the rights. And we'll get in a little bit later, we'll get into some other strategies that can, that can potentially help um, allay that uh, tension a little bit. All right, so what protection does a patent give you? 
It gives a right to prevent others from making, using, and selling the patented invention. So we'll discuss in a minute what we mean by patented invention. It depends on the application. And that protection runs 20 years from the filing date. And importantly, it only extends in the jurisdiction of the patent. So for example, if we have a US patent, our patent covers us to prevent others from making, using, and selling in the US, um, but it does not prevent making, using, or selling in other countries. Um, it is important to note though that it is making, using, and selling. So if someone is um, making in Germany and shipping to the US and selling in the US, your US patent could still um, could still protect you there. But there are there are definitely plenty of, especially larger companies that like to uh, file in the US and then file around the world to make sure that they hold, hold patents in multiple jurisdictions. All right, so just getting briefly to the parts of an application here, uh, just to sort of frame, frame what we're gonna discuss afterwards. Just speaking very generally, we have the disclosure and the drawing. So you see an example of a drawing there. I just grabbed that from a publicly available application. Uh, and then you have the claims. So in the disclosure and the drawings, basically we lay out all these different, um, different versions of, of what we thought our invention could be. So we describe the first one in detail, how each of the parts works, how they each go together. And if we can say, well, maybe in another version that seat could, um, could telescope differently, or maybe it doesn't telescope at all, right? We can include all these variations in the application. Uh, they're all labeled with numbers there. And we basically build as complete of a disclosure as we can uh, so that someone who is experienced in this area of technology can pick up the application and understand what we're applying for. Um, what that does mean though, is that we don't necessarily have to say, this screw goes here, it's shaped like this. Um, as long as someone can see how the things go together, we don't need to get necessarily to that level of detail uh, unless it's important. But if it's just, you know, we're fastening it according to normal, the normal way you would put something like that together and we don't need to, we don't need to uh, get too specific there. And then the claims at the end. So the disclosure really lays out all of these embodiments, all of these different aspects of the invention. Um, and really they're there primarily as a well of information that we can use to draft the claims at the end. And the claims are really the, the key, really where the, the protection uh, of the patent arises. All right, so I like to illustrate this point here because I think I think some some sort of intro to IP um, discussions kind of gloss over the gloss over claim scope, but I think it's important to really illustrate uh, exactly what exactly what this patent is protecting. So let's go back to our bike example, and um, if we could suspend belief for a minute and suppose that somehow no one had ever invented a bike before, right? We're the first people to come up with a bike, but not only have we invented a bike, but we have invented the, this bike with the motor that we talked about before. So we could write a claim like this on the right, as you see on the slide, where we have, you know, normally we wouldn't have element A, element B, element C, that's just uh, for illustration here. But, right, we write this first claim, which tries to lay out what we're trying to prevent others, what's new, and we're trying to prevent others from making, using, and selling. Uh, so we have a frame, we have wheels attached to the frame, we have a pedal device driving the wheels, and then we have our electric driving device attached to the frame, and right as we mentioned, it can generate power. Right, so suppose we file that, and you know that, that seems to represent the invention pretty well. Uh, the patent office can't seem to find anything because right, in this crazy hypothetical, no bike has ever existed before. Uh, so they just allow the patent, we get that claim, uh, and everything seems pretty. Everything seems pretty good. We can prevent others from making, using, and selling this this bike that we've invented. But what I wanted to illustrate here is that that circle on the right sort of represents what we're covering with this with this uh, claim, which is that red part in the middle, uh, versus what we potentially could cover, which is that sort of outer outline there. So because we included four elements here in this first claim, we're actually we're actually giving up 
some, some subject matter that we could have captured. So let me illustrate that with this next slide here. So here we have the same bike, right? Same motor, same frame, same seat, same everything. Uh, the disclosure is the same, the drawings are the same, everything up to the claims is the same. But now here we've just taken out that last element, right? Because we know that in this hypothetical, right? A bike hasn't existed. So now we say, oops, now we say um, we have a transportation device with a frame, wheels, and a pedal device, right? So even though, yeah, we, have, we do have that motor and we have invented that, we're going to try for a claim that doesn't necessarily include the motor, right? So now our scope is much wider, right? We can capture anything that has a frame, a pair of wheels, and a pedal device attached to the frame and driving rotation. So right, if we think about it this way, we could cover even potentially um, a stationary bike, right? As long as the pedal device drives rotation of the wheels. Uh, we could cover theoretically a tricycle, right? Even though it has three wheels, it does have a pair of wheels attached to the frame. Um, now in that case, the pedal device would have to drive the wheel, the two wheels, or at least two of the three wheels, but likely that would work out. Um, and even a go-kart probably with pedals would fall under that. It's a frame, wheels, and a pedal device attached to the frame. So. The point here is just that the claims dictate what's covered and they're critical in, cra in crafting the application. Because you can imagine here where if we had invented this bike with a motor and we had the first claim, the one back on the previous slide, uh, someone else could come along and someone else could read our disclosure. They could make a bike without the motor and we would not be able to stop them because our broadest claim requires the motor. Here, by taking the motor out, uh, we cover a lot more, a lot more than we did before, um, really capturing the scope of the broadest scope of the invention that we can. So, this definitely is an extreme example, obviously, to illustrate the point. But it really does come up in in every application we prepare. Uh, in almost all circumstances, the novel feature is is part of the final product, and it's not it's not the whole thing, right? So you may have invented a detailed product with, and it may have. Uh, 20, 20 parts to it or something like that. But uh, really one element or a small group of elements is what makes it novel. So it's it's important to make sure that you cover that you cover that that narrow portion of the invention that as as best as you can because by by limiting the the limitations in your claim here, you're ending up with uh, potentially the broadest the broadest scope of protection. And uh, yeah, I wanted to mention here too that this is this tends to be where um, really where the rubber meets the road in 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 the preparation of an application. Um, this spending time to make sure that you have have this broad claim can really be the difference between a very valuable patent and um, one that is not not particularly valuable. As you can imagine, I, we have seen some applications with. Uh, you know, a claim that might run on onto two pieces of paper, right? So you can you can imagine that trying to trying to prove that someone else is infringing, they would need to have each of those elements on all through all those paragraphs on both pieces of paper in their product or in their process or something like that. Um, and it would, it's it's very easy. The more elements you have in your claim, it becomes easier for competitors to design around it too. So. Um, Getting the proper claim scope is, is very important. All right, so, oh, and maybe a last note on claims there. If you're, if you're looking at, at other, you know, if you just come across other, other patents just during your normal course of business, so really focus on the claims at the end. They, they'll start with a section, they'll either say something grammatically awkward, like what is claimed is, and then there will be a list of claims after that, or might just say patent claims or something like that. But, that's really where you look uh, to identify what that patent covers. All right, so just briefly, let's go through the past process of obtaining a patent. So typically we meet with the inventors and we prepare the application. So as we mentioned, that has the drawings, it has the, the disclosure, the claims at the end. And as we mentioned before, while we're doing this, we're we hopefully do not have any sort of public disclosure, any sort of offer for sale. 
Uh, but then once we file it, once we have done the second bullet there, once we have a filing date, then once we have that date reserved at the patent office, then we're free to to disclose or offer it to sell or offer to sell it from there. And you can label your invention patent pending at that point. Um, typically from there, it really depends on the area of technology, but it can take anywhere from about a year to two years to hear from the patent office. And at the patent office, there's an examiner working in a very specific area of technology. Uh, so they see sort of the same sorts of, at least the same sorts of technology, if not the same sorts of applications all the time. Uh, they look for, as we discussed before, these publications, um, other things that have come before that they can use to try to say, well, I don't think, I think this, this first claim is too broad. Maybe the second claim is different enough than the prior art to get a patent. Um, they'll, they'll write us uh, what we call an office action. And then there's a back and forth process almost always uh, until, we, until we end up getting a patent or um, in, in rare cases, um, the rejection ends up being uh, either either too strong or or um, the examiner can dig his, dig his heels in, so his or her heels in. So sometimes we can the process can end there. But uh, I think usually I think the statistics for the patent office on the whole are about sixty percent of applications turn into a patent. Um, I think we file in an area of technology. I think we we tend to be closer to around eighty, but it is very it is very dependent on the technology, I will say that. Uh, there are some areas where it's as low as 10. And so if, uh, they tend to be very software heavy. Um, and so some attorneys could be very good at preparing applications. And But if they're filing in those areas, it's going to seem lower. All right, so I wanted to kind of wrap up the patent section here with what are some useful considerations, especially for startups. So the first we have here is a patentability search and opinion. So we really like to do this prior to the application. And so this is still, still while we're making sure that you're not publicly disclosing or offering, offering the invention for sale. Um, so what we do here is we talk to you about the invention in detail. We send a description of the invention out to someone who's a professional searcher. Uh, and basically what they do is exactly what the examiner at the patent office would do. They look for pre-existing technology that's close to what you to what you've invented, and with that um, with that information that that they find, we compare that to your invention, and we come up with a pretty good sense of either you know we think we can get a claim of this scope when we file the application, and maybe that's a very good very broad scope, uh, or maybe we feel like as we we're looking at the claims before, maybe we feel like we really need to add a lot of elements into that claim in order to get a patent. And then we can discuss with you, based on the number of elements we think we need to have in there, uh, is that is am I getting the value out of it um, that I need to? And because we're doing that prior to the application, um, we can avoid if if we if we find out that um, there's all this all this pre-existing technology out there that we were not aware of, uh, we can avoid um, filing, which is tends to be more expensive than the search and opinion. If it's not going to be, if it's not going to be valuable for you long term down the road, uh, usually though, it's more of a question of um, what scope do we think we can get. Not this. Uh, this art seems to be way too close. Uh, and so for provisional applications, I know we had a, a question here that I'll address at the end. Uh, these these can be useful. Um, but there are some some hangups here, and I do I do tend to get a lot of questions on provisionals from from smaller businesses, because a lot of uh, a lot of places will mention that they tend to be less expensive, which is true. The filing fees are less for the patent office. Um, we tend to use them if if, for example, someone came to us and said, "I I have a, a trade show where I'm going to disclose my invention in a week." and I need to get something filed to make sure that I reserve my date. And so since a week is a bit too short for us to prepare the full version of the application, we draft a provisional, which has basically the patent office says, I don't, I don't care as much what format it's in, um, just file, basically just file something. Uh, so the provisional, the provisional can take a number of forms, but the hang up there is that 
if we don't draft it like a normal patent application, then we can miss some of the detail that we can that we would end up including in the normal application. So um, just to illustrate the point, maybe, and this has been done before, maybe some, maybe you could file just a white paper as a provisional application, right? Some sort of research paper you've worked on and um, you know, file it in, say that that's my provisional. And then you have a year from that date to file the full application that we'd call non-provisional. The problem uh, sometimes is that the provisional, because it's not a patent application, it doesn't necessarily have all of the detail that you would include in a normal patent application. And the concept of filing the provisional is that it reserves this date. But in order to get the benefit of that earlier date, um, the patent office needs to be able to find everything in the non-provisional that was in everything that you're claiming priority in the non-provisional in the original provisional. So, you know, for example, maybe maybe we file a, a two-page just sort of quick paper that outlines our rough idea because we know you're going to disclose it in a couple of days. So we file it as a provisional and then we go to convert it in a year to a non-provisional. Uh, by the time we're including a number of drawings and we're going through all the different variations of what we could include in, in the invention, some of that probably can't be found in the original provisional. Um, and so whatever can't be found is basically basically does not get that original filing date. So if that's been disclosed in the meantime, uh, then, then that becomes a problem. So for provisionals, we really like to prepare nearly nearly a full-blown application. The drawings might not be, um, they might just be photos hand-labeled uh, with a, but the description itself, where we're gonna get the subject matter for the claims from, we try to have that as close as possible to, to um, a full application. So again, I mentioned there, um, you do have, it does buy you a year to decide to, to disclose, to offer for sale, to offer for uh, sale and to decide whether, um, whether this, this idea is worth proceeding to a, a full patent application over. And another point here, foreign filing. So just, that's just patent protection in other countries. Uh, so Right, it's the patent will give you protection making, using, and selling the invention. Um, so here we usually recommend to think about where uh, where competitors or, or potential infringers could be making, using, or selling. Uh, and it varies based on the area of technology. And the nice thing here is that suppose we file a non-provisional in the US, like a, like a regular patent application. We have one year from that date uh, to determine where we want to file foreign applications. Um, and then there are further measures called a, called a PCT, which uh, can act as a placeholder and sort of further delay that process. So you don't necessarily need to decide right up front. You can file your US application and then think about it a little bit where you need to file, if you need to file in foreign countries. And the last point here, uh, for continuation practice. So this is an interesting strategy that, that we uh, tend to use with some smaller, um, smaller businesses. So the idea here is basically that you can file an application and the patent office decides they like the claims and they decide to issue it. And right before you, it issues, you can file uh, what's called a continuation, where basically you say, okay, I'm going to take my first patent, uh, but I'm going to keep the disclosure sort of open. Um, so I'm going to keep an application that's, the claims might be different, but otherwise the drawings and the disclosure are the same. I'm going to keep it keep it pending so that I can, I can um, you know, work on it as, uh, as I see competitors maybe enter the marketplace. And so that, that's where it's particularly useful we have had one example where, in, in particular, where um, we were able to get a couple of uh, couple original patents, some through continuations, but we had one pending. Uh, and then we found an infringer who wasn't strictly falling within the language of the first couple, um, but because that new that continuation is still open, we can massage the claims a little bit there as long as we had support in the application. 
Uh, and then we ended up getting claims that were much more closely directed to, to what this infringer was doing. So it definitely gives you a lot of flexibility, especially if you have uh, one particular product or one particular concept that you're really developing. All right, so I'm not gonna spend, I'm gonna gloss over uh, design patents here. Um, it's not that they're not useful, they can be, they protect uh, ornamental features of products. Um, there are some other interesting applications too. They can protect sort of the design of user interfaces. You may have seen the Samsung and Apple uh, suit over basically what the front of a smartphone looks like, including the placement of icons and stuff like that. Uh, so they can, they can be very powerful, um, but, but they tend to be, um, you know, like I said, directed to outward appearance, um, you know, improvements in that sense. So it's not, uh, not, quite, as, not quite as common. All right, so, so trade secrets. So what are we protecting here? A trade secret is something that's really can be anything that's used in business that is right, not known or readily accessible by competitors, uh, has commercial value by not being known. And the, the owner of this information protects it through reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. So, okay, so, so what does that mean? Uh, just some examples, it could be, the, as I'm sure you may have heard, the Coke recipe, right? It's not accessible by competitors. They, they have it locked down. It definitely has commercial value and um, Coke protects it through reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. So they, it could also be databases. It can be um, business processes, cost and pricing information. Uh, it's frequently used for software code. So. Then the question is, you know, so how do you how do you protect a trade secret? And in contrast to patents, where we need to file a very specific document with the government and get it cleared through there before you have protection, a uh, trade secret doesn't require any type of filing. You protect it by creating physical, legal, and electronic barriers. So. That could be physical security. So in some cases, if you have a large corporation and you um, keep one particular company secret, uh, maybe it's a process or something, and you keep it this portion of the process in sort of a closed room, only certain people have key card access to it. Uh, those people have signed non-disclosure agreements so that if they encounter it, they don't tell anybody else, right? So that, that could be an example of physical security there, that sort of barrier between that only some people have access to. And then you have you know, similarly network or digital security. Uh, so who, who on the computer network has access to this information? Um, again, it, it, you have better protection if you're limiting it to not, you know, not just saying everybody can access this document, uh, but maybe it's a small subset uh, manager or something like that. And marking it confidential helps and uh, regular training of employees. So making sure that everyone is aware that anything marked confidential uh, you know, can't be disclosed outside the company, um, making sure that this sort of environment of certain things are secret and should remain secret. Um, definitely helps in, in what we were talking before about this. There's a reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. So potentially one of the issues here is that the trade secret only, is only protected as long as it stays secret. So um, if, let me think of an example here. If someone else independently discovers it, um, so for example, let's go to the, the, go to the Coke formula. Um, if someone else somehow made a, made a perfect replica of the formula and did not come across the information from Coke, then Coke, Coke can't, can't do anything to stop them. Uh, even if it might be exactly the same, because they didn't actually, they didn't actually obtain that secret from Coke. Um, so, if they put it out there in the world and they discovered it themselves, then uh, there's no protection from Coke's trade secret. Uh, someone could also reverse engineer something. So, maybe we go back to our bike example. If we if we sell our bike, and Someone could could take it apart and say, "Oh, well, here's how this electronic drive stores energy and then outputs it back into the bike." Right, so that's probably not a good candidate for trade secret protection um, because somebody can because right, we can't avoid keep we can't 
we can't keep the bike secret uh, and also sell it. So that becomes an issue there. So trade secret really, really uh, is related to, is very useful for certain things, um, certain things that can remain secret and is not as useful for things that can be reverse engineered or uh, that you have to put out there, have to put out there anyway. All right, so what type of protection do you have with the trade secret? So basically it's protecting you against misappropriation, so stealing of the secret. And that comes up most often um, with an employee who downloads either it could be software code or as we mentioned, customer lists and leaves and takes it to a competitor. You know, that, that's definitely where that comes up most frequently. Uh, and then improper disclosure, so that would be, um, you know, even, even that maybe that same employee, even if he doesn't take it necessarily directly to somebody else, he's um, violating his confidentiality agreement by, by broadcasting what, what this trade secret is. And so in those cases, you can recover some damages for, um, for, the, for the injury suffered by the company, and you can get some injunctions to prevent them from, from further disclosing. All right, so I think we covered our bike example a little bit here. But yeah, the last point I wanted to cover here for trade secret was the comparison versus patents. So as we mentioned, patents, you you have to file and you, in exchange for basically telling the world about your invention, in, in exchange for disclosing it, you get this time limited 20 year monopoly from the original data filing, right? And as we saw with the claim example that we had, it's, Patent tends to be a, a strong form of protection because even if we've invented this bike with all these bolts and particular bells and whistles located in various places, uh, our patent coverage might extend beyond that. Uh, the trade secret, on the other hand, oh, let me stick to patent for a minute. Patent does, though, as I mentioned, is a formal filing process, right? And then, and there is expense in in preparing the application. Um, whereas trade secret. You don't have to tell anybody about it. So in that sense, it can last indefinitely, right? Like the Coke formula, they would not want to file a patent application on that because although they would be protected for 20 years from their date of original filing, after those 20 years, anybody could use the formula and Coke would not be able to stop them. So because they can keep that secret, it's better for them to protect it through these confidentiality measures. Uh, and in that sense, it can last indefinitely. But it has the narrower scope of protection because it's protecting the formula itself. It's not protecting, like we saw with the claims before, where you can get this sort of scope um, scope around your invention. And the other benefit there is that for trade secret is that there's no formal filing process, uh, but there are expenses, of course, in um, in crafting these confidentiality barriers. Right, you have to. Um, set up the network security or the physical security or that kind of thing. So I think the main takeaway there is that these different forms of protection can be very useful, but uh, for different things. All right, uh, moving through to trademarks here. So what can be protected with trademarks? So this could be a word, a phrase, um, a symbol, even a smell or a color. But what we're really looking at is anything that can be used to identify and distinguish a source of goods or services. So frequently we see right, Nike, it could be the name Nike, it could be the swoosh logo, right? But anybody encounters those and they think, oh, that must be coming from Nike. So that, that type of association between a mark and a, and a provider of those goods or could be services, uh, is what trademark is really looking to protect. So I came up with uh, with an example here. Let's suppose I was, so bear with me, I was reading the uh, Wright Brothers biography recently. So if we had this uh, th this bike with the motor, you know, maybe we call our company the, the Wright Cycles Company, and we call this particular bike uh, the Propedler. So through trademark, if we're, as long as we're selling, right, this is, and we're presenting to customers. This bike is the Propedler. It's sold by Right Cycles. Uh, we're labeling packaging that, that it comes in or it's on the bike or both. And uh, customers are encountering those terms when they go to buy the bike. Those are both 
uh, potential trademarks for our company. All right, and then, so first here, what's what's interesting about, about trademarks is that there is a level of common law, what we call common law, uh, trademark protection uh, without even filing anything. So suppose we start selling these bikes with Propedler and Right Cycle Company and customers start purchasing them and we've developed this sense of uh, customer loyalty or goodwill with, with our brand. We all, without filing anything, we already have some level of, of trademark protection in both of those names or maybe logos we might use with them. Uh, that, that protection is automatically granted upon use of the mark. But the problem to some level with, with common law trademarks is that it is restricted to the geographic area of the market which we're selling in. So if we're selling these under right cycles throughout Chester County, um, but we're restricting our sales to Chester County, someone in Delaware County could call their uh, bikes the Burr Peddler and um, we would not be able to stop them at least under common law trademark. So for common law, you can use the symbol TM as I have there on the slide, or if it's a service like uh, maybe a right bike repairs, you can label it SM for service mark. And uh, the benefit of using that, that, that TM or that SM, using that label, that it provides some notice to potential infringers um, that you're at least aware that, that this mark is, is something that is associated with our goods and services. So we generally recommend, and we'll talk about federal filing in a minute, but uh, for your common law trademarks, we do generally recommend uh, using that that TM or that SM designation when when you can, and I'm I'll put my contact information up at the end, but I'm happy to happy to talk that through with you if you need it. All right, and then federal registration. So so we discussed that common law does offer some level of protection, right? Just by using these marks in relation to your goods and services, but federal registration gives sort of a, a much more enhanced level of protection to the mark. So this process, typically we uh, do a search first to see what other marks are out there, somewhat similar to the patent process. And uh, based on that search, then we can file an application. The search isn't, isn't, isn't necessary. Uh, if you're already using the mark and you're already dead set on using it, we can go ahead and file. Uh, the search does become particularly useful though if you're in an early stage and you're thinking, well, maybe maybe I'm I'm considering this, this uh, name for this product, or maybe I'm considering this other name, uh, the search can give us a good sense of which might be preferable from a trademark perspective. So to get this, this uh, federal registration, you need to be using the mark in commerce. So you need to have the goods and services need to be sold in relation to the mark. And we actually have to submit uh, photo, maybe photo, but or other evidence. It could be like a uh, advertising bulletin or something like that, uh, showing the mark in relation to the goods or services, like a customer would encounter them. So for the bike, if we took a picture of the bike, and it said the propeller on the bike, um, and customers are encountering it in that state, then that would be sufficient proof that we are using it, using that mark um, to form this sense of uh, customer relationship. And the second is that that mark is capable of distinguishing the goods and services. So we have that pyramid there on the right. And this is, um, I think, pretty interesting part of, of the federal registration process. So we have generic marks there at the top, or we have arbitrary or fanciful marks there at the bottom. So generic marks are not capable of, of offering trademark protection because they are um, not capable of distinguishing the source of goods and services. So a generic mark might be like, uh, like apple for an apple, right? The federal government doesn't want you to uh, obtain trademark protection on apple for apple because that would preclude uh, you know, selling just basic descriptions of, of the product people are trying to sell and would be overly exclusive in definitely in that in that market. So arbitrary and fanciful is the other end, more, more specific end of the spectrum. And so what they're saying there is that 
these marks are so either fanciful is the sense that it's the word is made up. It's just a series of letters that it doesn't exist. So in that sense, if someone encounters that mark, then they're going to say, oh, uh, or they're more likely to say, oh, it must be in relation to these goods and services. Um, you know, because I've never seen this arrangement of letters before, except in relation to these particular goods and services, right? So it's that mark is is better capable of distinguishing the source than something generic. Uh, and the arbitrary aspect there would be uh, like Apple for computers, right? So we can use Apple there because we're not just it's not being used in relation to an Apple, right? Apple has nothing to do with the computer goods that it's being sold with. Uh, so in that sense, it's it's still capable of distinguishing the goods and services. And to obtain registration here, you need to fall fall within this sort of middle range, somewhere between suggestive and uh, arbitrary and fanciful. So it needs to be to be distinctive enough that um, it's not obviously it's not generic. It's not just apple for apple, um, and it's not what we would call descriptive. Let me come up with an example here. Yeah, suppose we called our bike um, pedal assist or something like that, right? The mark is just describing what it does. And again, it's similar concept to generic. In that sense, it would be kind of tying up too much um, too much territory by, by sort of describing a broad area of goods instead of using a mark that consumers can associate with a particular source. Um, and then our, our example before, ProPedler, would fall under suggestive, and as, that's under the line there. So that's that's um, fine for registration. So suggestive would be some sort of mark that's um, it suggests something about the use, but it's also partially a made-up word. So it's also uh, capable of distinguishing the goods and services more so than something that's just straight up descriptive or generic, right? So ProPedler is a made-up word, but it is sort of suggesting there's pedals, there's propulsion, but um, it would definitely fall under the suggestive category there. And then the last is the, the last requirement is that the Patent and Trademark Office is going to make sure that uh, the mark that you're filing for isn't likely to cause confusion with any other mark that's on, on the register. Um, so they compare the goods and services uh, the similarity there versus the similarity of the marks. They balance the two um, and determine whether, basically whether it's likely that a consumer would would encounter this these marks and these goods and say, I, I'm not sure if if this is the same company or or if these are two, two different companies. All right, so for our second question here, um, I just wanted to see, Right, which of these can serve as a trademark? So this is a little bit, I will say this is a little bit unfair. Uh, one of the examples here, you kind of have to, uh, you know, wasn't wasn't one of the specific examples I gave. So you kind of have to extrapolate a little bit, um, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, so uh, so interesting, yes. Yeah. So so library for coffee beans actually can serve as a trademark because, right? It's not it's not uh, generic. It's not descriptive for the underlying goods. It's uh, it would probably be considered arbitrary, right? Because it's just a sort of like Apple for computers. It's just like a term that people wouldn't necessarily associate with coffee beans. So in that sense, it's somewhat distinctive. So that one can. Uh, B, coffee coffee company for coffee beans would be a little bit too descriptive, I think, for the patent office's um, patent and trademark office's uh, you know, opinion, because that's that's a little too a little too descriptive of of the underlying goods. 
um, so they don't want to they don't want to tie up too much too much of that of that area. And actually, this one's this one's pretty interesting here. The third one, the jingle broadcast from an ice cream truck. So that actually is trademarked. Uh, I think I don't know if it's Mr. Softy or what what company it is. Um, but if you think about it, it's it's something that's identifying a source of of goods, right? If you hear that that jingle. Um, or specifically, if kids hear that jingle, they they know, you know what what what's coming. Uh, they know they know what goods are associated with that song. Uh, so, the point there really is just that it's not just words um, that can serve as trademarks. Uh, you could be it could be sounds, it could be smells for perfumes, it could be uh, the color, the, actually the color pink in relation to the uh, Corning uh, insulation. That that that's a trademark. So really, the point we're looking to make there is that trademarks, uh, trademarks are really source identifiers, and they're protecting consumer goodwill associated with that source. So uh, we'll wrap up trademarks here. Um, the trademarks offer protection against another use that's likely to cause confusion. So we touched on that a little bit with getting the federal registration. Um, basically, someone infringes your mark if, if, a, if a, consumer would encounter both and be confused about, about whether they came from the same source or not. Um, so federal registration is very beneficial. That can offer uh, presumption of ownership and exclusive right nationwide. Uh, it can also give public notice of your ownership. So, right, so that's nationwide instead of just in the area you're selling. Um, and by being out there and registered, it's easier for others to find your mark and avoid using it, which, which is Although it's hard to measure that benefit, that's that's one that can be significant uh, down the road. And it's also, you have a much easier time obtaining uh, higher damages for infringement um, if you if you have the federal registration on your mark. All right, so lastly, we'll just compare to the other two forms we've discussed so far, patents and trade secrets. All right, so um, as, I think, as I think is clear so far, that these are all very different Right, patents are covering sort of the concepts of inventions. Right, trade secrets are maintaining things that are secret, um, have some overlap with patents, but not necessarily. Right, so trademarks here, it's something entirely different. Right, it's goods, it's the association of, of consumers with a source of goods or services. Right, it's that goodwill that we're protecting, not, not a product, not an invention, not, a, not something the company um, not a trade secret, not something that the company has has created and um, is giving them is giving them benefit in a different sense through branding. So, but the point I wanted to make here was that um, the trademarks can be just as powerful as some of these other forms of protection. Right? I think we've all encountered uh, multiple goods or services that seem pretty interchangeable, at least on a, a functional level, like maybe a. You know, the example I was thinking of was paper towels. You might have multiple forms of paper towels, and right, I think functionally they're all pretty similar, but uh, some sell better than others, and and it's probably due to the branding, and they sell for uh, for a premium on on the more uh, generic versions. Um, but I think the point is that we can all we can all think of some sort of example there where. Um, Two goods or two services might be quite similar, uh, but the sort of associated branding with one uh, fetches a higher price and, and is worth the, the trademark for that company. All right, so lastly, we will cover copyrights here. So at least in a business sense, this might come up a little bit less frequently, maybe, um, unless your business is artistic, like a photographer or a painter or something like that, in which case it would probably be the most important. Uh, but here we're protecting original works of authorship. So they're literary, dramatic, uh, musical, or artistic, right? So it could be a book, it could be a song or a movie, um, or computer software would fall under this too as, as text. Um, but the interesting point here is the copyright is protecting the expression. So using our bike example, if we took a photo of this bike, we would have a copyright on that photo, so we would we would be able to prevent others from copying that specific photo of the bike. 
um, but it's not giving us protection in the underlying idea, which is more of the concept of patents. And as you can see here, I sort of highlighted our, um, our copyright labeling at the bottom here uh, to illustrate that right, this, is, this presentation is another thing that can, be, that can fall under copyright, that arrangement of, of the images and the text that we have in this, uh, in this presentation is covered by copyright. And interestingly, copyright is formed the moment the work is created and fixed in, in this is some of my favorite uh, IP language, fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So what does that mean? Uh, that basically means when I completed the text and the images on this presentation, I had some level of copyright in it without filing anything. Um, that's, that's when the copyright triggered. So the same goes for songs or, or movies or other written material, um, or as we mentioned before, computer software, right? Whenever it's, whenever it's written down, whenever it's, and that could be on a computer, it could be on a piece of paper, whoever authored it has the copyright in that work. And there's, that offers protection against reproduction, uh, as you have here, public performance, recording and broadcasting. So really we're looking at straight copying, but also um, sort of translations to different forms. So if I write a play, I have a copyright in the text of the play. Uh, but if someone reads it out publicly, um, then my, my copyright would extend to that performance. And so we recommend using the copyright notice as we have here at the bottom. And you can, as soon as you have it fixed in a tangible medium of expression, you can put that copyright at the bottom. And uh, you want to just include the circle C, the year, and the name. Doesn't necessarily have to be in that order. Uh, but that does give somebody, uh, similar to the common law trademark that we mentioned before, it, it, um, it at least prevents someone who encounters it from saying that they didn't know it was copyrighted. Um, and it probably also gives them some sense that uh, you, you, you could be out enforcing it too. All right, so lastly, what does, what does federal registration get you on the copyright side? Uh, so interestingly, you do have to register it in order to file suit. So although we mentioned at the beginning that you have the copyright from the moment it's created, uh, if you do want to actually file a lawsuit, you have to have it registered beforehand. Um, and there is the registration also gives you a presumption of validity and ownership if it's filed uh, within five years of the creation of the work. And those are basically things that help uh, with any suits that arise down the road, it really kind of um, is a shortcut in what you need to prove in order to prove that your copyright was uh, was uh, impermissibly reproduced or or performed or those other those other uh, various elements. And it also gives you statutory damages. So copyright it can be somewhat difficult to prove what we would call actual damages, right? So if you just have a copyright and someone uses it without statutory damage options, you'd have to be able to say, um, this use cost me X dollars of lost profit or something like that, right? And that proof can be, can be pretty difficult um, to, be, to be certain about and to include a lot of evidence about. Um, so having a federal registration helps sort of shortcut that process because what we call statutory damages are uh, damages sort of just written into the law that say for each instance of an infringement of this work, um, the damages fall within this range. So, so proving proving what you need to recover becomes much easier. And the the registration process for copyrights too is also uh, quite inexpensive. Um, I think the the actual fee is in the neighborhood of fifty dollars. And sometimes we do it, so then we would add add our time. Uh, to it also for clients, but we have also trained some other clients who, you know, like if if they're if they're photographers and they're going to be filing this frequently, but well, we can take some time and say walk them through the process, and then they can they can do it on their own uh, and save save quite a bit of money that way. All right, so just quickly wrapping up here, uh, main main takeaways: uh, the patent. I think the most important thing is to be aware of the disclosures and sales for the filing deadlines. That's that's kind of a major tripping point and that the claims dictate the value of the patent. Uh, for trade secret, um, 
Yeah, I think it's important to keep in mind that it's a potential alternative to patents as long as it can remain secret. But but there are some trade-offs in terms of the scope of protection um, by while also having the benefit of the fact that you don't have to disclose it. Uh, for trademarks, probably the most important thing is to, to remember is that it protects the customer's association with the business through source identifiers, uh, and that there is some level of protection without filing, but uh, filing is highly recommended, at least for what we would call your core marks. Uh, so if you have a business and um, a handful of products that each have a different mark, we would, and you're selling a lot of those, we would we would recommend filing for each of those, each of the marks on those those sort of important products that are moving a lot of. Um, if you have other sort of marks that um, are a little bit more internal or you use less frequently, um, sometimes we'll just leave those, we'll recommend leaving those as common law protected. Um, and so copyright, copyright protects, the important thing here to remember is that it protects expressions versus pet. So the, the actual form of the written, written document or uh, in this case, the presentation or the movie or the song, uh, but it doesn't protect necessarily the underlying idea. And again, you have some level of protection without filing, but filing is necessary for suit and is very beneficial ultimately for, for recovery. All right, so thanks everyone uh, for, for making it through that presentation. I hope, I hope it was informative on some of these areas of IP. Um, there's my contact information there and I'll take some questions um, I did also want to mention that uh, if you if you want to talk further about any of these or or talk further about these specific forms of protection for your business, we we don't we don't tend to charge for an initial consult. Um, so if we're just talking about which forms might be appropriate for your business um, and the process of of going about getting those, uh, that that time usually isn't charged. So you know, don't hesitate to. Uh, to reach out and, and figure out how we can help you protect these various aspects of your business. Um, or you could reach out uh, to Leo through the launch box. Um, and I think he would just, he might just pass you along to us. All right, so let me pull up uh, some of the questions here. Kevin, can you see the questions in the Q and A uh, from the, from the uh, presentation? Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a handful of questions in there that, uh, probably best if you read them and, sure. and answer them rather than having us feed them to you because they're a little, sure. a little long and a little bit, a uh, little in depth, so. Sure. Yeah, so I see the first one from uh, from Douglas Schumer. So he mentions a uh, question for the end, if not covered, uh, for establishing a filing date for a non-provisional utility, can one follow provisional by a second provisional to have two years prior to the non-provisional filing? Okay. so. Um, the short answer here is no, uh, but there are some other considerations to provisional. So, but yeah, to directly answer your question, you can't create a chain of provisionals to keep the, the time pending. If you file a provisional, you have one year from that date uh, to file the non-provisional application. But provisionals do not count as a public disclosure. Um, so if you, for example, filed a provisional, um, didn't want to convert it, you let it expire at a year, but in that year you hadn't publicly disclosed it or you hadn't offered it for sale, um, then that clock still isn't running. So you could theoretically file another provisional, but you would only be able to go back to the priority date of the second one, not all the way back to the first one. Uh, there are also other, sometimes we have someone file a provisional, like a first one, and then they'll keep developing the invention in that year. And we filed sort of intermediate provisionals in between um, that sort of add, add additional subject matter onto that first one. And then we'll file the first non-provisional one year from the earliest provisional, uh, including all of that information in the one application. And so basically what that does is that it, it kind of reserves dates along the road uh, for these various parts of the invention. All right, so um, Buzz asks, the startup wants to protect its patents from malicious prosecution, forces the company into bankruptcy where the patents are grabbed in liquidation. The founder also expects that the angel or VCs investors expect to have ownership until an exit. 
Can the IP be in another entity with the investors being protected? Um, let me just read that again. Yeah, so, so the company can keep, I guess let's go back, maybe let's start with, with the inventors of the application. So the inventors work for a company and they've likely signed an agreement that says, whatever I invent is the property of the company. So when they create the patent, they sign over a doc, sign a, a document saying, I'm transferring this application to the company, right? So, the, so now as, as the application is running through the process and turning into a patent, it's owned by this original overarching company. Uh, in this case, um, whatever the first one that these angels, uh, or, or that the uh, that the ownership formed. So as far as, as bankruptcy goes, um, I would have to ask some of our other bankruptcy um, attorneys about exactly how far you can reach into um, the value of the patents and, and how, how they're contributing to the company. Um, but I can I can get back to you on that one. If you want, I'll just write that down. Okay, so uh, Doug Schumer asks, if you do not follow a provisional with a non-provisional, is the subject matter? Oh, I think we I think we addressed that. Uh, yeah, it remains secret if you do not uh, convert it. Okay, uh, Jonathan Kleck, regarding the non-obvious standard, how does that apply to code? We are developing an app that brings together several APIs and some code that our developers wrote. Can we protect the full aggregate of all the tech together or only the unique code that we wrote? Right, so, so this is, um, software in particular tends to be, especially recently, tends to be a pretty, pretty difficult area of patent prosecution. Uh, there are a lot of laws that are in flux right now about what what you can protect and what you what you can't even protect with a patent in software. Uh, so our general rule of thumb is that as long as you can you can tie the function of your software to some sort of actual change that happens uh, in the real world. So um, when I worked at the patent office before I came here, I worked in autonomous vehicles. And there, as long as we had, we could claim a lot about the software, but as long as we tied it to an actual output of the vehicle, maybe it turned the wheel or something like that, um, then that's software that we can claim in a patent. Uh, more recently, the patent office has been very resistant to allow patents on software per se. Um, so that's, that's definitely something to consider from a software perspective. But I guess to answer Jonathan, your question more directly, um, your, if we file an application on right, this, full, this full aggregate that you have, as we, as we sort of went through in the description, um, we wouldn't be filing the code itself. We would be sort of talking about, right, there's a block here, it's a, it's a processor, here's the memory, here's what it does all together. So as long as we can describe some unique aspect of what you've created as a combination, then you could get a patent on that unique aspect. So most inventions incorporate uh, some pre-existing technology. So um, maybe in our bike example, you know, going back to not assuming that a bike is just a novel thing. Uh, but if we had the bike with the motor combination, we get a patent on that, right? Just because um, maybe the bike and many, many other components uh, came before um, doesn't mean that we can't get a patent on, on that particular improvement. So I hope that uh, answers your question here because, yeah, so, so bringing together APIs isn't necessarily, um, isn't necessarily going to prevent you from getting a patent as long as we can still point to a unique aspect uh, of what you've invented. All right, so Buzz Clark asks, you have patents and are disclosing your plan to investors to raise go-to-market funds. Uh, when what can be done in foreign markets in the future? Okay, so that's a good question. So, so going back to sort of our foreign uh, discussion, so 
let's assume that we filed and maybe we obtained a US patent, but um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't pursue foreign protection at the time. So we are far enough along in that process now that we don't have the option to go back and file in foreign countries. So um, although we have the US patent and we can disclose this plan to investors to raise funds, um, what can we do in foreign markets? Um, not, not much. Um, but as we went back, as we were talking before, um, that U.S. patent would prevent would help you prevent others from making, using, or selling in the U.S. So you can reach foreign actors in the sense that they're coming into the U.S. and your U.S. patent protects you there. Uh, but yeah, there is similar to disclosing versus filing the patent. Um, it, ca it can be a difficult decision um, that you have to make up front within a year of filing your U.S. application. Uh, do you, where do you file in foreign countries? Um, it, gets, it gets pretty expensive to add applications to that list. Um, and there are ways to delay it further into the process, which, which can help with, uh, with keeping your invention pending in the U.S. while raising funds. Um, but yeah, that, that, that can be an issue. But um, ultimately, yeah, you, you need to get your, your foreign protection up front. All right, so Doug asks, is there any use in keeping the old style notebooks with dates showing the developments of the invention? Yeah, this is a good question. Or the American Vents Act discount all usefulness? Right, if there's an interference with two inventors filings in the same date? Yeah, okay. Yep, okay, so, so, Previously, there was a practice of anyone who could be an inventor, engineers, anything like that, uh, recording, recording in their notebook dates of everything that happened, um, just so that you can go back when you filed. We used to be in a system called first to invent, where someone could file and say, even though they filed after someone who filed first, they could say, well, um, you know, I invented this, they go through this rather complicated legal process of trying to prove that they were actually the first ones to come up with it. To streamline that, the US has moved to the first to file system, which agrees with the same type of thing that's been applied, applied in most foreign countries. And in that sense, it's, it's pretty much a race to the patent office. Um, so keeping the dates in your notebook, uh, that can be useful in litigation later, uh, it's possible that that um, maybe you need to prove which that this inventor contributed to this invention. I mean that that's an issue that can come up. Uh, but yeah, dates and notebooks in terms of of creating priority uh, is is no longer useful. Um, so it's really it's really the first person to file in the patent office is considered the one to have rights to the invention. All right, and Doug Schumer asks, in the situation that an inventor signed a contract to assign future inventions to an employer and their patent is issued? Yep, and he does not assign the patent to his company. How is contract law and patent law reconciled? Yeah, um, so if he has signed a contract that says that Usually it'll say something along the lines of anything invented within the scope of my employment or using um, employer uh, resources to develop this invention is the product or is the property of the employer. Um, so in that case, it it really is the property of, empl of the employer. Even if he if he refuses to assign it over. Um, and it became a big enough deal, I guess, then the company could could, uh, could, could go after him and say, when you sign this, this document that, that says that you assign it to us. So um, in terms of the question for, for reconciling, contract law would, would govern there and say, yeah, even though he's the inventor, he agreed as the inventor to assign his rights. So the employer, the employer owns it in that case. All right, um, I think I made it through the questions here and unless anybody else has, has any other questions.
No? Okay. Right. Yeah. Been, so, really yeah, appreciate, Kevin. Out. Sure. Yep. Go ahead, Leo. I just wanted to say really appreciate your time and, uh, and uh, sticking around to answer all the questions. And uh, we'll have this presentation up on the Launchbox YouTube channel. Um, if you want to take another peek at it and, um, and review, you know, a lot of really good information from Kevin. So um, uh, if you want to reach out to Kevin, uh, his information's right here. If uh, uh, we can also help connect you and um, just wanted to say thanks again for, for joining us. And thank you again to Kevin for a really great presentation. All right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Take care. Thank you, Kevin. Yep.